the introduction and adoption of 5G is already changing the communications networking and services landscape, but the industry is already thinking about and working on what comes beyond 5G. To find out more about these critical developments, I'm talking today with a panel of experts who are helping to prepare the communications industry for its next evolution. So let's meet today's speakers. They are Clara Lee, Senior Principal Engineer for Intel Next Generation and Standards and ION Global Forum Technical Steering Committee Chair. Benoit Pelletier, Director of Next Gen Ecosystems and Alliances for VMware and Co-Chair of the NextG Alliance Steering Group. Miko Usitalo, Head of Research Department for Nokia Bell Labs and Overall Lead for HexaX. And Ian Gillett, Founder and President at IGR. Welcome everybody. This is a fascinating topic. So to set the scene and to bring us up to date with 5G developments, let's hear from Ian Gillett. Ian, over to you. Thanks. So um, it may seem a little bit strange to be talking about what comes after 5G, because to many people it appears that 5G actually is very, very new. In reality, uh, the, the adoption of 5G is very well underway. The operators, the mobile operators around the world have been working on this for some years now. Um, obviously, we have devices out there, we have consumers, we have business users, all using 5G networks in different parts of the world. Um, what people find a little surprising is actually how advanced many of the 5G adoption uh, is in many of the markets. So if you just look at the, uh, the globe here, if we look at somewhere like the US, Europe, today it's just a couple of percent of the connections we have, the mobile connections we have are actually uh, using 5G. But by mid-decade, uh, 2025, you can see the US is up to 46%. Europe's at 30%. We look in Asia, and I've just shown some select markets here, and you can see China today is at about 12.5% of their connections are using 5G. But again, by mid-decade, they're actually over 51%. Uh, South Korea's over 60%. Uh, Japan uh, today, again, at just a couple of percent, but soon gets up into the mid-30s. And then Australia, um, up near 30% as well. Um, the interesting thing about mid-decade, if I say mid-decade, it sounds a long way away. It's actually three years. Um, <laughs> in mobile operator terms, it's actually two years because of the planning they have to do ahead for these types of things. So really, it's not too early to be talking about what comes next after 5G. Um, LTE, 4G, uh, has been around over a decade and obviously is very well established around the world. And 5G is very quickly starting to take its place and uh, you know, get to the, where the majority of connections are actually um, on 5G. The other important thing here, and we'll probably talk about this today, is virtualization. The way the networks are actually built and architected has changed. Um, so in the past, we had very much dedicated hardware and software uh, supporting the mobile networks. Today, the operators over the last decade have done a lot of work to move to a virtualized environment where hardware and software are separated. And now some of the newer networks that are being built today actually are using cloud uh, radio access networks um, where you know, a lot of the, the compute power is actually put in a cloud data center. Very different architecture from what we've seen in the past, which fundamentally changes the cost structure, it also changes the uh, speed to market, the, the speed with which uh, upgrades can be applied, and a lot of different things. So um, 5G fundamentally changes how the wireless industry operates, um, but that change is already well underway. So not too soon to be talking about what do we do next? Great. Thanks, Ian. That is a great way to set up the rest of today's panel. Uh, now, let's find out more about our other panellists. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the organisation you represent and its role in Beyond 5G? Uh, Miko, let's come to you first. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, uh, in Europe, there is uh, one flagship uh, project working on 
6C. So that's uh, Hexa X that I'm leading. So it's a flagship uh, research initiative funded by the European Commission with uh, strong participation of uh, major industry and academia. And uh, it is uh, developing the foundation of 6C and contributing to industry consensus uh, leading to 6C. So the focus is on structuring, framing, developing technology for connectivity needs in the 2030 timeframe. Uh, and uh, it creates a 6C vision uh, and defines an intelligent fabric of technology enablers connecting human, physical and digital worlds. OK, excellent. Thank you, Miko. And uh, Benoit, over to you. Sure. I'm pleased to talk about three strategic beyond 5G initiatives where VMware is deeply involved. The first one is the NextG Alliance, a new initiative to advance North American mobile technology leadership over the next decade through private-led efforts, with a strong emphasis on technology and commercialization. The work will encompass the full life cycle from R&D, manufacturing, standardization, and market readiness. One of the main goals is to advance North American global leadership over the 5G evolutionary path and 6G early development. The second is the Open Grid Alliance. It's an initiative that was recently launched. It's about a think tank, a corporation foundry, and a marketplace for the fungible edge. It's open to all industry and academia. The Open Grid Alliance seeks to benefit society by engaging commercial and community forces to dramatically accelerate the transformation of internet infrastructure. And the third initiative is a public private partnership to support research on next-gen networks and systems called RINGS, the Resilient and Intelligent Next Generation System Program. VMware, along with Intel, Nokia, and six other leading companies are partnering with NSF and Department of Defense. It's a program to accelerate research on future versions of cellular, Wi-Fi, and satellite networks, as well as next-generation networking and computing systems. The RINGS program is NSS's single largest effort to date to engage public and private partners to jointly support research program. Okay, thank you, Benoit. And Clara, can you tell us about the work you're involved with? Uh, yes, so I'm involved in the uh, ION Global Forum. Uh, so this is a forum that was formed in uh, early 2020. And it, 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 it has now um, over 50 members. So the goal of the forum is to define the, uh, the com communication and the computing infrastructure that would enable the next generation uh, system. So um, more specifically, uh, it has two main pillars. Uh, one pillar is on, uh, to enable the all uh, photonics network uh, and it's provide a high speed uh, transport uh, for the future uh, system. And the next pillar is the, uh, to enable a uh, data-centric infrastructure. So this is the uh, computing uh, infrastructure that uh, would uh, enable uh, the next, next generation network cloud to be built on. Yes. Great. Now, those are all really interesting industry developments. Thanks, everybody. Um, now, what technology spectrum and system aspects will be the focus beyond 5G? Uh, Clara, let's start with you on this topic. Yeah, so we are still in the stage of defining what is the next generation technology. So, uh, uh, so to our current investigation, uh, we see a few key features that would be enabled in the uh, next generation system. So uh, one is uh, we will continue to enhance the communication service that the system can provide. So this uh, include, uh, for example, 10 times uh, higher uh, performance uh, in, in terms of uh, throughput, uh, lower latency, uh, higher um, energy, uh, lower energy efficiency, and higher um, spectrum efficiency. Uh, and also, uh, we will also continue to uh, provide the communication service for the verticals and uh, uh, provide a better service for, for verticals. Uh, and uh, another very important key feature that we see for the next generation system is uh, uh, besides the communication service, 
we will also provide uh, uh, services for computing and data. So this is new because in the past generations, um, the communication system, the mobile network is mainly a um, transport network uh, that provide the data pipes for the applications and devices. Uh, but more into next generation, we expect uh, the, computing, the mobile network would also incorporate uh, uh, computing and the data services um, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the devices and the applications and to the cloud. And another feature is uh, we expect uh, the network would have would would integrate more intelligence. So we will use the intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, to help the network operation, and also to help the interface operation. Um, and also um, one uh, another feature is uh, we expect uh, the um, the next generation system to also upgrade the transport network. So in this sense, we will have a higher speed transport. And also the transport network uh, will be service aware so that it can uh, flexibly steer the, uh, the traffic to the desired service uh, endpoints. Yeah, so, so those are the key features we see uh, for the next generation system. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Clara. And, uh, and Miko, what about you? What do you see as the, the main focus uh, for technology spectrum and systems? Yeah, in uh, HexaX, uh, we have identified uh, six main research challenges for 6G. So first, uh, connecting intelligence. So if you would use the AI ML as a fundamental base for the new generation, so how would you build the system? And uh, then the second research challenge is uh, network of networks. So multiple types of resources uh, need to be aggregated to create a digital ecosystem that grows uh, more and more capable, intelligent, heterogeneous, uh, eventually creating a single network of uh, networks. Sustainability is the third research challenge. So 60 itself needs to be sustainable, but also we are looking ways uh, that uh, how could you use 60 to make other sectors of uh, society more sustainable. Global service coverage is a fourth one. So we are looking for efficient, affordable solutions for global service coverage, uh, also connecting uh, remote uh, places. And the fifth research challenge is extreme experience. So how can we take uh, all the relevant uh, key performance indicators uh, from uh, the previous generations, uh, like extreme bit rates? How can we take those to the next uh, level required uh, for, for 6G? And then the sixth research challenge is uh, trustworthiness. Uh, so that we need to take uh, uh, into account uh, from the very beginning of uh, designing the new new generation. Okay, excellent. A really interesting uh, set of points to focus on there. Uh, and Benoit, what about you? What what will be the the key areas of focus for technology systems and spectrum beyond five G? Well, let me complement with um, the, the focus on the fusion of the wireless, the networks, and the cloud. We will need to focus on the internet. The internet was built from the core out. Now we need to rebuild it from the edge in. And the Open Grid Alliance will especially focus on the re-architecture of the internet. Let's think about it. Now, the human experiences will evolve from basic content consumption to real 4D immersive collaborations. Then we'll see the internet evolving toward a compute grid and eventually an intelligence grid. This evolution will enable IE interactive intelligence application to be distributed around the globe and where it's needed and on demand. Really interesting insights there. That's, that's turning the internet around back on itself. Very interesting. Um, now, what is different in terms of this work compared with the technology developments we saw with 5G? Is there a view towards sustainability or addressing the digital divide? Uh, Benoit, let's start with you this time. I think it's an important difference in this work is the methodology that we're implementing by assessing and monitoring five technological change vectors. You know, we've got the radio evolution, we've got the compute evolution, with the web and data evolution, as well as the operation evolutions. Let's make sure that we have the full coverage to address the divide, uh, digital divide. And the sixth factor, you know, is important as a vector is the societal evolution. 
the strategy toward the sustainability and VMware is pleased to have a leadership position in both the Societal and Economic Drivers Working Group and the Green G Working Group under the Next G Alliance. So if we want to take care of our beautiful planet, we must get it right. And everyone has a responsibility here to reduce the Next G technologies, you know, energy consumption and environmental footprint. Okay, thanks, Benoit. Uh, and Miko, is there a lot of difference here between the 5G efforts and what's going to happen beyond 5G? Yeah, while 5G enables us to consume digital media anywhere, anytime, the technology of the future should enable us to embed ourselves in entire virtual or digital worlds. Human intelligence uh, will also be augmented in the world of uh, 2030 by being tightly coupled and seamlessly intertwined with the network and digital technologies. Certainly sustainability is uh, very central and there we should do everything we can to have 6G sustainable and also help with 6G to be other sectors of society being sustainable. This sustainability we are of course uh, doing already now with the current technologies, but this is getting all the more important. Okay, great, thanks Miko. Uh, and Clara, is there more focus beyond 5G in terms of sustainability and addressing the digital divide? Beyond 5G, we will see a tighter convergence uh, between communication and computing. So on the one side, uh, communication will move to the, will be um, uh, further be cloudified, the network will be, will be further be cloudified. And on the other side, uh, we, we will see um, computing will be um, further distributed. Uh, by leveraging the uh, the uh, the networking capabilities, and also we will see more intelligence um, coming into the network. Um, so the we will um, see the artificial intelligence will be used for help the network operations, the interface operation, especially when the um, in the high capacity scenarios, and also we will see the network uh, will help to um, facilitate. Uh, the uh, the workload, uh, uh, the computing workload uh, to hold the intelligence operations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, you, Clara. And uh, and Ian, do you want to come in here? Do you have a view on whether the bigger picture here is broader than it was with five G? Um, I think it is. It's it's an interesting question because really, what we're developing now beyond five G is really much of the time. So if we look back at the previous generations of wireless technology, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we didn't expect that everybody would have a mobile device with the capabilities they have today. The networks were never architected to deliver that type of bandwidth, that type of connectivity, that type of compute power. And um, so as we've added more and more and more, um, <laughs> we've ended up with uh, more power consumption, we have more equipment in the network than we ever imagined. And so some of that has tried to be addressed with 5G, as we talked about virtualization, the use of the cloud, etc. But what comes next is really taking that and saying, okay, this is a mass network. This is a global network that connects everybody to everything. So how are we going to do that without um, driving up the power consumption you know, how are we going to do that with sustainability in mind? And if anything that 2020 and 2021 have shown is the importance of connectivity and closing that digital divide, how do we do that for everybody and not just, um, you know, developed markets or, um, you know, in the middle of Europe or US or whatever, but for everybody. And so I think, yeah, it becomes all of those things. And But sustainability, digital divide is absolutely uh, one of the prime goals here. Yeah, absolutely. These are really key considerations as we look beyond 5G. Okay, um, let's now turn to focus on the users of these next generation services. Uh, Miko, uh, can you speak to the use cases you feel might be part of the work to be done beyond 5G? Yes, uh, uh, certainly. So in the European flagship on 6G, HexaX, uh, so we have uh, already published uh, our first uh, deliverables uh, telling more about uh, the use cases and you can find those from our website. So let me 
go through this uh, uh, current uh, uh, result uh, from this work. So we have uh, identified uh, six use case uh, families, starting from the use case family of uh, sustainable development. Uh, so as said, uh, 6G needs to be sustainable and we need to find ways how 6G can help other sectors of society become more sustainable. Then we have also left uh, one family like uh, open for additional evolving use cases. Certainly such are on their way. And uh, then let's move to this uh, use case uh, family of uh, massive twinning. So we already have uh, digital twins uh, and uh, here we are expecting uh, taking this to a totally new level. So massive twinning, uh, uh, building digital models of uh, entire cities or large industrial complexes or even wider physical entities that uh, uh, make it possible to model, design, uh, plan, uh, operate uh, and also do some preventive maintenance. Uh, so detect uh, problems before they appear, uh, for example, then to operate uh, traffic and other functions in a city. Then uh, moving to the use case uh, family of uh, telepresence, so fully merged uh, cyber physical worlds. Here we are looking at uh, a human or set of humans uh, uh, interacting with the machine or set of machines or each other, uh, interacting independent of their location uh, using all appropriate uh, senses and also interacting with some objects uh, in the digital world with no physical realization so far. Uh, and uh, this can take place in the context of uh, work, for example, mixed uh, reality co-design or in the context uh, of uh, sports, uh, other cultural events or gaming. Then let's move to this uh, use case family of uh, robots uh, to cobots. Uh, so here we are looking at uh, a machine or set of machines uh, helping a human or set of humans to, for, for the humans uh, to reach their goals uh, in, in a better way. Also uh, collecting information and augmenting based on this information, the operation of the humans. Then use case family, local trust zones uh, containing uh, several cases uh, for localized uh, uh, connectivity. For example, local coverage uh, uh, for temporary usage. So being able to provide uh, coverage uh, connectivity in an area where there is no permanent network infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Miko. And Benoit, do you want to come in here and, and talk about some of the potential use cases? Yeah, great overview, Miko. Uh, and I think that's part of the NextG Alliance. We've created uh, an application working group which will focus on the emerging um, you know, uh, apps and use cases. It will be important to collaborate you know, and exchange on, on the different views and different angles. I like the diversity in opinion and in views. But I can't wait to be in such immersive, holographic and tactile environment. Tactile internet will bring something new and, and for sure, you know, it will enable uh, new novel uh, solutions and services and use cases. And at the end of the day, I think that we're probably going to agree that the, the killer apps for 6G will probably come from an unexpected corner anyway. So, OK, excellent. Thanks, Benoit. Uh, now, of course, these are all very exciting developments, but when, we, when will we see them? Uh, in what time frame will these technologies be introduced and how does that fit into the standardization process? Uh, Miko, let's start with you here. Yes, yeah, so now it's uh, the time of uh, starting and getting the research uh, moving uh, and uh, open, open dialogue and evaluation. Uh, what, what are the visions and uh, what kind of technologies are relevant and what could those accomplish? And uh, based on this uh, initial work, uh, we are then expecting to have some systemization research project uh, beginning to like uh, construct uh, the system view for 6G. Then uh, next phase would be mid of the decade, uh, uh, roughly to start uh, standardization work. And uh, then the commercialization would be only towards the end of the decade. Okay. and uh, and. Benoit, what, what are your thoughts on, on the timeframes we're looking at here? Yeah, the time frame we we have as part of also on the uh, Next Year Alliance, uh, a national 6G roadmap working group who will focus on, on trying to identify, you know, the 6G visions, its life cycle roadmap and the time frame. So I think it's safe to say that, you know, while the 5G is not complete and will take several iterations to get 
you know, to, to mature uh, until 6G, it's probably going to take, you know, eight to 10 years for 6G technologies, you know, to, uh, to be mature and then starting to be deployed. So I, I would say that even um, if, you know, other elements of 6G don't have to wait for terahertz as an example to be deployed. So I'm expecting to see next G, next gen AI, XR, or special computing um, before you know the 10 years uh, time frame. So I, I think that as soon as the grid is deployed, you know these will enable such uh, advanced technologies uh, to be used by the end users. Okay, great, thank you. And, and Clara, do you have a, a view on what kind of time frames we're looking at here? I agree with the, the previous two speakers. I think uh, um, roughly um, now we are at a stage of uh, prepare the technology and do um, conduct the pre-standardization um, technology development, and then roughly at the mid of uh, uh, this uh, this decade, we will see um, um, the uh, standardization activity to start, and then commercialization. Uh, would be towards the end of this of a uh, twenty uh, towards uh twenty twenty thirty time frame, yeah. So I, I agree with the time frames uh, mentioned by uh, Miko and Benoit. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Clara. Uh, now you all represent leading beyond five G alliances and forums, but you also represent key technology suppliers. Why are these early Beyond 5G initiatives important to your companies and also, of course, to your customers and partners? Uh, can we start with you here, Clara? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so we say that uh, uh, computing and the interconnect uh, infrastructure is uh, crucial to achieve uh, 6G system goals. Um, and also 6G will also bring in new capabilities and uh, uh, that can advance computing and uh, uh, and the uh, and data te technologies. So, so Intel has a very broad product portfolio and a deep technology expertise on computing, communication, and interconnect. So therefore, uh, we think Intel is in a very unique position to be at the core of the uh, 6G technology development and com commercialization. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Benoit, what do these developments mean for your company? As 6G becomes a reality, it will reshape our economy as we know it. You know, it's going to enable you know millions of undeserved subscribers who are stuck in the digital divide. The advancements in, in the 6G con connectivity will also enable our society to take the full advantage of advanced technologies, you know, which in turn will improve the lives of billions across the globe related to improvements in healthcare, quality, life, and education. So VMware is committed to building more equitable, sustainable, and resilient world through its ESG 2030 initiative that is focused on three key imperatives, trust, equity, and sustainability. So these three you know, next G initiative are fully aligned with our vision and, and our commitment toward our customers to help them, you know, give them opportunities to reinvent their role in the next G communications landscape as well as monetize novel services. And Miko, what does this mean for your company, your customers and your partners? Yes, yeah, so cellular connectivity technologies are certainly very central to our product and service offerings to our customers. So uh, it's uh, very essential for us to be active and in a leading role in this development and uh, looking very much uh, forward uh, to working with uh, others in this. So certainly we need uh, momentum in the industry towards uh, the right directions expressed uh, in, this, uh, in this panel. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody. So um, Ian, what does all of this mean for consumers, enterprises, operators, and vertical industries? What benefits will they get and what should they start thinking about now to be ready? So if we look back at what we had in the 80s, we thought it was fantastic. We can make a phone call, right? I mean, you can make a phone call while you're outside on a, on a cell phone. Um, then we had texting, we had basic camera phones. Remember the first camera phones? I mean, we thought it was amazing. And then came the BlackBerry. We had basic uh, texting, uh, basic data connectivity. Now you look at what we've got with the smartphones, uh, tablets, 
um, connectivity in vehicles, public transport, uh, airplanes. Um, and it's quite amazing. We can sit on a plane, for example, and watch a movie streamed in. We can also do the same thing in a car. We can play a game. So the capabilities we have are you know, infinitely more advanced than they were two decades ago. So what you're asking now is, well, what, where do we go from here with that? What, what's the next step for that? What do we imagine is going to happen? And I think the answer is really more. Um, so I can still play that game, but it's a much more immersive uh, uh, environment. Uh, AR, VR headsets. I have high bandwidth, low latency capability everywhere. Um, and that means in the sky, in a vehicle, on public transport, at home, at work. Um, the, you know, I think it was Benoit said, you know, about the killer app. It's very difficult to predict what a killer app is, but somebody's going to come up with what is going to use that low latency and high bandwidth um, to maximum effect. And you can see what's already happened with 4G and 5G is already that started to happen. So I think we'll see more of that. From the vertical industry point of view, um, a lot of the stuff that's happening in manufacturing right now takes use uh, for you know industry 4.0, makes use of low latency, high bandwidth connectivity for machine tools, manufacturing uh, tools, etc. In a in a manufacturing plant, uh, beyond 5G, will take that capability and move it everywhere. So it's not just in a specialized plant with a specialized installation. That capability is available uh, to you know, long distance trucking, for example, transportation, ports, um, the home, everywhere we want it to be. For the operators, it, it's actually an interesting transition they're going through now. Um, the operators have, the wireless industry has been relatively self-contained for the last few decades because we've had such specialized equipment uh, now we are incorporating as part of 5G the cloud into those wireless networks. Uh, the panels today talked about edge computing and moving the compute into the mobile network. That's going to continue. Uh, and I think to Clara's point that the operators become part of the compute fabric. Um, and uh, it, it's a much more uh, cohesive, tied in environment between cloud, compute, connectivity, device um, is, is a really tight integration. So, so for um, everybody sitting in a garage with some great ideas and coding skills, you know, the sky's the limit here in terms of what's capable and what the possibilities are. Well, this has been a really tremendous discussion. It's very encouraging how much time and effort is already being focused on what comes beyond 5G. So thanks to everyone for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you.